Everyone remembers the images of irradiated debris raining down on the far side of the moon. Now, the Space Court, opening its session in lunar orbit, is set to hear its first case, a mixed claims arbitration nine years in the making, between a multinational group of countries and corporations as the applicant, and a single nation as the respondent, stemming back to the fateful events between December 6th and December 20th, 2050. On December 6, 2050, astronomers at the Near-Earth Object Observatory detected a fast-moving object coming from behind the sun. After careful analysis, the astronomers notified world leaders there was a 99.5% probability it would strike land mass in the southern hemisphere. The astronomers also determined the object was approximately 120 meters in length, 40 meters in width, and 40 meters in height, with a mass of 5 times 10 to the 9 kilograms. They classify the object as a city killer but the respondent identified it as a country killer. The UN Security Council convened an emergency session to discuss options to prevent a catastrophe. At the same time, the respondent held its own internal meeting. Respondent began a multi-day campaign of staging retrofitted nuclear missiles on orbit. This was part of a plan they had presented to the UN Security Council, but did not receive approval from the member states present. On December 20th, without further notifying the UN Security Council, they launched those nuclear missiles from orbit to destroy the object. The respondent determined they had destroyed the object and neutralized the threat. Almost. However, the remaining debris was captured by the moon's gravity. The radiated debris began to impact the lunar surface. 27 different structures experienced significant damage, including six solar cell fields, three supply depots, a manufacturing facility, and ten astronaut housing facilities. Fortunately, no personnel suffered any harm following the initial impact. Almost all civil and commercial activity has ceased on the backside of the moon. The cost of the damage is calculated between $17.5 and $37.2 trillion. This is the first time the Space Corps has been called to order. Their docket has started to fill, but no judgments have been rendered. Who will prevail? We turn now to hear the case. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All rise. The space court is now in session. President Adaji, Justice Kaplau, and Justice Newman presiding. May it please the court. I represent the applicant, who brings this case against the respondent for their unilateral actions on December 20th, 2050. The applicant brings two claims. First, that deployment of nuclear missiles in space was not legally permissible. And second, that respondent is liable for damage caused on the moon and in cislunar space because it violated obligations under Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty and because respondents' actions are not precluded by the doctrine of necessity. To the first claim, respondent violated Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty by sending nuclear weapons into space. The treaty provides, states agree not to place nuclear weapons in orbit, install them on celestial bodies, or station them in outer space in any other manner. In this case, respondents' placement of nuclear weapons on orbit is a clear violation. To the second claim, the respondent is liable for damage caused on the moon and in cislunar space because it breached its obligation to engage in consultations and to conduct its space activities with due regard to the corresponding interests of other states. The respondent had the obligation of informing the international community of its decision to execute the nuclear missile strike, but failed in its duty to do so. The respondent also had the obligation to conduct its nuclear missile strike with due regard for the corresponding interests of other states. 
The meaning and extent of the obligation to conduct activities with due regard was stated in the Chagos Marine Protected Area Arbitration, where the tribunal stated it was dependent upon the nature and importance of the rights held, the extent of the anticipated impairment, and the availability of alternative approaches. Both obligations require foreseeability of damage by either potentially harmful interference or anticipated impairment. Foreseeability is established under international law in the Corfu Channel case and has subsequently been held to a reasonable person standard. Clearly, the consequences of throwing an entire nuclear arsenal at an asteroid in near-Earth space were reasonably and generally foreseeable. The respondent will attempt to assert the doctrine of necessity to preclude this claim. Article 25 of the Articles on State Responsibility provide three elements to assert this defense. First, the act must be the only available course of action. Second, it must safeguard an essential interest against a grave and imminent peril. And third, the act must not seriously impair an essential interest of another state or that of the international community as a whole. The respondents' use of their nuclear weapons was not the only available course of action. As the court held in the Gabchikovo Nagyamoros project case, States should seek alternative options if there are other ways through which the same results could be achieved, regardless of whether these are more complex, costly, or time-consuming. The respondent was aware of other options because of their participation in the UN emergency session, and respondent could have informed the Security Council of their final decision and should have provided the international community an opportunity to consult on their unilateral act. Therefore, respondent fails the first element of necessity because it cannot defend its unilateral act as the only available course of action. Regardless, the respondent's unilateral decision to launch nuclear missiles without notice significantly impaired an essential interest of the international community, which is the freedom to explore and use outer space, including the moon. This concludes the applicant's argument. Thank you, Your Excellencies. May it please the court. I represent the respondent, who is here to defend their actions and safeguarding the lives of its citizens on December 20th, 2050. The respondent answers two claims. First, that deployment of nuclear missiles in space does not violate the Outer Space Treaty. Second, that the respondent is not liable for damage caused on the moon and in cislunar space because it did not violate obligations under the Outer Space Treaty. And regardless, respondent would be able to claim the doctrine of necessity. To the first claim, the deployment of nuclear missiles to outer space does not violate the Outer Space Treaty. Article 4 applies to placement of weapons of mass destruction, and in this case, the missiles were not weapons deployed against another state, but rather a defense mechanism against a natural threat. Furthermore, the missiles were clearly not intended to be permanently placed in orbit, installed on a celestial body, or stationed in space. The missiles were clearly sent from the Earth to execute a tactical strike against the asteroid, with no fixed placement along the way. To the second claim, the respondent is not liable for damage caused on the moon and in cislunar space because it breached no obligation to consult or to conduct activities with due regard. The respondent was under no obligation to consult with the applicant or any other country because its actions were intended to preserve its citizens' lives and never intended to, nor had reason to believe it would cause harm or interference to anyone. And the respondent clearly showed due regard in the planning and execution of its life-saving mission. The tactical nuclear strike was successful in destroying 97% of the object, as it was designed to do, and was made with the intent to remove the threat to itself, a threat to which no other country had a corresponding interest. The applicant argues that the standard should be reasonable foreseeability of general harm. 
However, multiple scholars have argued that the liability threshold in space must consider the difficulty, if not impossibility, of foreseeing all forms of damage that may be caused. Furthermore, the compromis clearly shows that there was already a difference of opinion with regard to the asteroid's composition, so reasonable persons were already having great difficulty in accurately predicting what would happen. The respondent acted with the information it had because it believed allowing the asteroid to approach any closer to Earth would destroy our country and cause devastating environmental harm to the planet as a whole. In total, because the respondent conducted its actions with deliberate intent and careful consideration, it has breached no duty to any other country under the standard of the pulp mill case. Regardless, if this court does hold that respondent breached a duty, the respondent can assert the doctrine of necessity. As previously stated, the respondent was ultimately the only country willing to act without further delay, and the court should hardly need to deliberate whether the lives of an entire citizenry is an essential interest. All parties agree the threat was grave and imminent, since the UN Security Council also called an emergency meeting to discuss possible solutions to an international crisis. Regarding the third element, the respondents' actions did not affect an essential interest of any other state since the applicant admits that no life was lost and the only effect has been a disruption of commerce. We remind the court that the threat we were facing was an asteroid that had only been identified two weeks before impact. That the respondent was able to foresee a solution to destroy 97% of the asteroid, save the lives of its citizens, and avoid an environmental catastrophe on Earth should be reasonable enough. This concludes the respondent's argument. Thank you, Your Excellencies. All rise. This concludes oral arguments. The justices will now deliberate. Your Excellencies, the court has concluded oral arguments in the preliminary hearing before this court's Mixed Claims Arbitration Division. We are now to deliberate and make preliminary judgments on the case concerning claims brought by the applicant arising from the acts of the respondent. The court is asked to resolve two issues. Issue one, whether deployment of nuclear missiles by respondent is permissible. And issue two, whether respondent is liable for damage caused on the moon and in cislunar space. Madam President, all justices are present and the clerks are ready to proceed. Thank you, clerk. I will turn to Dave. What do you think of this case? Well, for me, it's important to separate the two principal legally relevant documents, the Outer Space Treaty and the Partial Test Ban Treaty. With respect to the Partial Test Ban Treaty, there it seems to me that the respondent is in clear violation, that there's no, no escape hatch from that treaty. And the respondent's vulnerability there, it seems to me, is pretty complete. As a second matter, I would hold that there's been, in addition, violations of the Outer Space Treaty, both Article 4 and Article 9. On Article 4, I would find that there's been a violation by the placement in orbit of the nuclear explosive devices, that if they had proceeded to a direct flight and a direct intercept, a transiting space, rather than placing the, the, the bombs in orbit, that might not be a violation of Article 4. But placing them in orbit, even one time around the Earth, it seems to me is a violation of Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty. Madam President, if I may, I, um, one of the things I was thinking about here was, do we have nuclear weapons? Because, of course, not every ex nuclear explosion in space is the result of a, of, a, of a nuclear weapon. And these are clearly repurposed to be an instrument, an, an implement, if you like, to, to, to deal with the asteroid. But I do think in this case, we are dealing with 
and, and you know the, the stock of nuclear weapons when they were put in orbit they were nuclear weapons and they then became repurposed on the way once they were deployed on the mission i think again there are quite strong public policy arguments for a, a, a quite a strict interpretation on article 4 because you know the the what we wouldn't want and what i don't think this this tribunal would want is to leave any gaps for potential deployments in anticipation of threats that may or may not come from outer space. I agree with you. I use the term nuclear devices when referring to those missiles going to the object, uh, because we can still talk about this, the question of explosion, but I absolutely agree with you that uh, when they were placed in orbit, they were repurposed nuclear missiles, nuclear weapons. So I do agree with uh, both justices that there was wrongful act and the placement of nuclear weapons on orbit. Yes, I, I would find that any nuclear explosive device placed in orbit is a weapon. That there is no distinction based upon the purpose, function, intended use that the nuclear explosive device in orbit is inherently a weapon uh, and that therefore Article 4 is applicable. And I would find that putting this instrument in orbit around the Earth even once does constitute a violation of Article 4 by placing in orbit around the Earth a weapon of mass destruction. We have not discussed the danger that the placement of these uh, nuclear weapons around the earth uh, created. So when we talk about um, this wrongful act being potentially excused uh, based on necessity, uh, we need to make sure that we take into account the dangers that the nation itself created through their actions. Well, and for me, the, the, the next step is to zoom in on the, the, the definition of the necessity excuse. What, what, what do we take that to be? The best authority on this is the International Law Commission. That's not a treaty, they're draft articles, but it's the best authority we've got. And one of the elements is that you cannot invoke necessity if the act in question is likely to create a comparable or greater peril for others. If you take that as the standard, the time to assess the comparable or greater peril to others is at the time of the act, rather than after the fact, when we know what the consequences in fact turned out to be. At the time of launching these nuclear weapons, the respondent could not have known what the full array of adverse impacts on others would be. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're talking about here is, is, is the balancing of these competing interests, that it's highly unlikely that this was going to be, you know, a zero effect um, solution. There was going to be some sort of some sort of effect. And at the time, the state balanced that against the, 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 the risk to itself. And I also think we should bear in mind, again, in, in, our, in our contemplation, as David rightly said, this is at the time of the proposed impact. So I think that, you know, there's, there's a number of factors that are at play when we do balance these competing interests. I have to say, I think that in terms of the, in terms of that balancing act, I think that the, the damage caused to the installations on the moon was <laughs> damage to, 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 to lunar installations is foreseeable, be it from, you know, naturally occurring phenomena, be it from, um, you know, human created phenomena. I'm, I'm thinking about the, the, the damage that they must have been aware occurs in the space environment. There's a hostile environment and things like this happen, be it natural phenomena in asteroid strikes or be it human created phenomena such as this. I would like to bring a point to you on that. One of the reasons why, um, Sam Page and other uh, scientific group when discussing how to best mitigate uh, an asteroid impact threat is to use impactors rather than nuclear devices first. 
is of the risk of something going on, something wrong going on at the launch pad if the nuclear device or nuclear weapon explodes when be sent to uh, to space. And what worried me in the method that were used, especially if we think about when it happened and not afterwards when we know that the all the launches went okay and nothing happened to the respondents country nor uh, civilians is that they they put their own nationals in peril by sending that many nuclear even one nuclear weapon sent in space is not something that has been tested we do not know what could have happened on orbit but even on the launch it a lot of things could have gone wrong and they did so several times so i understand the defense uh, of necessity in trying to protect their nation but doing so but by putting a potential peril to their civilians uh, does not fit the bill for me i would not be inclined to second guess the technical and military judgments made by the respondent in determining what response to make to this particular threat. That is, this court's expertise is in law and policy and logic, but not in assessing the probabilities of a malfunction on launch. So I would be inclined to defer to the wisdom of the respondent in determining how many weapons to launch, when to launch them, what facilities to use to launch them, there's certainly a risk there, but I would let them be responsible for, for that judgment in these excruciating circumstances. The, the Outer Space Treaty does not prohibit launching nuclear capable missiles. The treaty could have done that. The treaty could have said that any launch with a nuclear weapon on, on a missile is so dangerous that it is to be prohibited. The negotiators did not do that, uh, and therefore, it is lawful for a country to undertake the launch. Dave, on your point, I understand what you mean, and I understand that uh, in this particular case, the respondent's decision, the national decision that they made to launch uh, those nuclear weapons uh, was based on fact that we do not have, but we trust that they made the right decision on that. I also uh, appreciate your point on the fact that there is nothing to prohibit the the launch of uh, n nuclear devices. I was bringing this point up only because we were dis we were all in an understanding that there was a wrongful action, and we were discussing the potentiality of a defense of necessity. And this defense was the nation is trying to protect its nationals. So doing something that could put their nationals in danger by the method that they've used, I thought was relevant uh, in this case. These points that I'm bringing right now would have been brought up by Sam Page and would have been discussed if there had been consultation. For me, the question here is, what form of consultation is required compared to what form of international discussion did occur in the Security Council? Article 9 places a, a duty to consult, but it does not specify the format or the location or the types of communications that are to occur. Um, in some circumstances, it might be that the most appropriate form is bilateral diplomatic exchanges. In other forms, there might be international discussions through same page or some other multilateral body. The state practice with respect to Article 9 consultations has been quite inadequate. There have been very few instances of countries overtly citing Article 9 as uh, the, the rationale for the international discussions that, that take place. So we're, we've, given, we've been given very little guidance by states as to what it takes to, re, to comply with Article 9. And I'd be prepared to consider the discussions in the Security Council as satisfying the requirements for consultation. It is just consultation. It does not require agreement, does not require deference to another country. The discussions in, in the Security Council seem to me to have adequately covered the duty to consult. I think this is the this is almost for me the real nub of the issue here. I agree with David 100 percent that there is 
currently insufficient guidance as to what consultation looks like, what what consult what the parameters of consultation are. are. Is it a simple statement of facts that they are informing other states of? Is it a, a, a request for ideas, a request for you know operationalization? Is it a request for assistance? We we just don't know. So I think that I think it is that it is the lack of consultation that causes me disquiet here. Well, I, I would be in dissent on that point. I believe that the respondent did enough to satisfy Article Nine by participating in the discussions in the Security Council, and that there was no other venue and not enough time to undertake more expansive consultations. Perhaps what I would say is on a finding of fact at this time, we may be, we may be you know, sympathetic to the activities of the respondent. On the other hand, what we could do is say that actually we don't think there is, there has been sufficiency of consultation and we leave it up to those deciding damages and deciding the amount of damages to make the decision that actually, you know, they, they did try and do something. So the question is, what's the appropriate way to evaluate and balance all these risks? That, I submit, is not a decision before this tribunal. We are not in a position to second guess whether the respondent had a better alternative or a less risky alternative. All we can do is to assess, did they comply with the provisions of the treaties? And with respect to placing in orbit a nuclear explosive device, I think we're prepared to find that they violated that rule. With respect to consultation, I would be prepared to find that they did enough to satisfy Article 9, but the bench may be divided on that point. Regarding consultation, um, my positioning, I understand your point on uh, the fact that presenting in front of the Security Council can count as consultation. Uh, however, the applicant did underline that neither uh, Sempage nor COSPAR, which are the venues that are dedicated to do that kind of consultation for that type of situation were consulted. So in terms of diplomacy and uh, policy, the idea of presenting in front of the Security Council is one way, but to me, the, the competency of consultation was not reached because the dedicated groups who deal with those types of situations uh, COSPAR and SEMPAGE were not uh, at all consulted. There is the question of foreseeability of damage and your regard. I have a difficult time uh, through the brief we hear that there was no way of knowing damage on the moon would occur. And again, I am I'm questioning the statement because when sending several nuclear weapons towards an object that is uh, near the Earth and thus near the moon, uh, the idea that it uh, there is no way of knowing that damage would occur on the moon seems suspicious to me. Well, I would start by examining the relevant legal standard, which in this case, I take to be Article 3 of the Liability Convention, which specifies that in the instance of damage being caused elsewhere other, other than on the surface of the Earth, the actor is liable only if damage is due is due to its fault. And the term fault is not defined in the treaty, has not been adequately defined in other international law. It might well be a case of first impression before this tribunal. But it seems to me that fault can also, be, uh, can also be constituted when the country behaves in a deliberate fashion where it is aware that there are possibilities for harm being inflicted upon others but and it decides to proceed anyway that that's not quite negligence but it is to me another form of fault so i would find that the respondent is responsible because it was deliberately proceeding in a fashion that was in fact causally connected to the harm and was reasonably foreseeable uh, that it would cause that harm and that even if the country as as respondent here was behaving in a skillful fashion it was nonetheless deliberately inflicting or running the risk of inflicting that harm and is therefore liable under Article 3 of the Liability Convention. 
I would argue that there are ways uh, for seeability in this situation. Since over the past 15 to 20 years, the International Planetary Defense Group and Council, uh, led by uh, most SEMPAGE members, have played out simulations of such circumstances. And through these simulations, every single time, there is a clear indication that with a use of any type of mitigated device, there is a risk of the object breaking in pieces and impacting um, the Earth, other countries on the Earth, or uh, in this case, the moon. So I would say that based on the information that was available at the time of the decision, the country had to know or was had a duty to know that such action of launching a mitigation tool against an asteroid would create debris that could impact uh, the moon and thus the properties potentially on this moon. And for me, that that gets to the to the bottom line of this case, as a policy matter, I'm comfortable with the legal outcomes. That is, to me, the respondent here was placed in an, in an impossible circumstance, facing the imminent danger of mass destruction on their territory and finding that the international community was unable to come to the rescue through because of the division of the Security Council, the respondent did what I think I would have done. That is launch the nuclear missiles to protect my country. And it does seem to me that that's a, not only a reasonable, but it's, it's a virtuous thing for the country to do to try to protect itself. At the same time, that activity had immense adverse consequences for the applicant. And therefore, I think the respondent is liable for the damage done to the applicant's facilities on, on the lunar surface. It's not because the respondent was, do, do, was behaving in a malicious or evil fashion. It was behaving in a self-protective fashion and doing everything it could by the, the best state of the art to mitigate this immense danger and as I said, I think I would have done the same thing, but there's a consequence. Madam President, I think you have a consensus. I absolutely endorse the, uh, the, the words of, of, uh, of my fellow justice there. I think that, yes, it, you know, I, I think ultimately what we're talking about here is, did they do anything, you know, did, did what they did, was it a proportionate response? And yes, it was, it was a proportionate response, okay. What does the law then say? Do we want the Outer Space Treaty to have a lacuna regarding nuclear weapons that can be stationed in orbit? I don't think we do. Do we want clarity in consultation? I think we do. Do we want liability for fault to be clearer and better defined? I think we do. And I think this case takes us forward on that. I think David's exactly right. The result was a satisfactory outcome for the, for, the, for the respondent, but there are consequences for that outcome. Your Excellencies, have you reached a judgment? Yes, we have. Please notify the bailiff. All rise. President Adaji will now present the judgment of the court. To the first claim, this court finds for the applicant that deployment of nuclear missiles was impermissible. To the second claim, this court finds for the applicant that respondent is liable for damages caused on the moon and in cislunar space. The court is now adjourned. Case, ILB versus Rocketman. For rebroadcasting games without the express written consent 
of the Commissioner of Interstellar League Baseball. Stay.